I think we left off talking about coup rates and the dummy league in, and we talked about the uh, reactivity of certain coup rates, uh, back bonding. We talked about that. Uh, one of the other reactions that coup rates participate in and do well is uh, one for addition, which we've seen already. <laughs> with a different reactant. Uh, but if you take an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl and you treat it with a cuprate, the dominant pathway is 1,4 addition. Uh, and again, it goes back to that uh, hard, soft acid base theory where cuprates are considered soft and that the beta position or the four position, which is right here, is considered. Uh, a soft spot, right? So the cuprate is adds there, and then you can trap it uh, as a silane to make an enolate, a siloenol ether, or you can treat it with a, an electrophile, right? Which is right here, like benzyl bromide. You can treat it with that electrophile and add here. And the stereo selection, I have it shown the stereo selective here. Uh, it's really based on facial selectivity, right? So you when you do the one four addition, you're going to have both of these products, right? So you'll get this is not a single and uh, single enantiomer. You also will get the other enantiomer as well. So, but that's just to show the, the selectivity. If uh, if if the electrophile reacted with this enantiomer where the methyl group was on the wedge, then it would come from the opposite face. And if it reacted with the other enantiomer, where the methyl groups on a dash, then the benzyl, brom the benzyl bromide would come from the opposite face. So if this was dashed, then that would make this would be wedged. Right? It's just it's just a, a simple uh, steric argument for that. All right. Um, so we're going to shift gears. We're still talking about uh, organometallic coupling. We're still talking about the application of a lot of these different. Uh, reactions to, again, wider uh, applications, right? So we, we, we understand the method development. We understand like we take certain reactions and we develop them to be used for wider applications like total synthesis. So we're gonna start talking about uh, this compound right here, this FK506, uh, right? This particular compound. Right. It's in a family of, of uh, compounds uh, like rapamycin, like cyclosporin. And so FK506 in the late 80s and early 90s became like this big thing because of its biological activity. Right. So you can see it's what we, what we call a macrocycle. It's a huge cyclic molecule with a lot of stereo centers. And I put this in the middle of the organometallic coupling because <clears throat> there's some reactions in here that are kind of pertinent to what we're going to be discussing later. And then also uh, there's some reactions in here that you'll see on that third problem set, right? So for FK506, the reason why it's important is it's like an, it has an inhibitory effect on T cell activation. So it's kind of a probe for early events that lead to T cell activation. And it's used as an immunosuppressant, right, for uh, organ transplants and things like that. So it's a very important molecule. Uh, it's actually commercially available now as tacrolimus. And the thing about it, it's, it's not something that you, uh, that was initially isolated from, you know, a sponge. Like a lot of your natural products are usually isolated from like a sponge or isolated from some other natural natural source, <clears throat> but you can all, you can understand the importance of being able to synthesize, <coughs> excuse me, a molecule like this, uh, and do it 
such that you can scale the reactions up. I think at the at the final um, at the uh, after final synthesis after they completed the synthesis, I think they ended up using something like uh, a total of like fifty six steps to make FK five hundred six. All right, so there's a, there are a lot of reactions in here uh, that are necessary uh, for to. And then, and then it's a good review as well, right? Because there are a lot of reactions that we've already talked about, um, especially the protecting group chemistry and things like that. All right, so the synthetic strategy is to kind of chop this up into pieces, right? This is the retrosynthesis, where you can see all of where those little red dashes are. That's where we want to chop this up, but that's where the Schreiber group decided to chop this up and do a convergence synthesis where they build these fragments and then uh, take the fragments and merge them all together in some uh, kind of culminating event at the end, merge them and get the overall molecule, right? So we're gonna talk about the building up of fragment one, fragment two and fragment three and all these papers are already on, on Blackboard. They're in the, in the folder label, FK506. He actually published uh, four papers. He published three papers, three short communications dealing with um, the uh, synthesis of the fragments, and then he published a full paper uh, in 1990 in JAX uh, that deals with the whole synthesis, like the entire, the complete synthesis. Um, and so to build up fragment one, you can see you have to actually build up all of that functionality, all this functionality that's shown here, right? And you have to build that backbone up with the proper stereochemistry because again, FK506 is an immunosuppressant. So it's gonna have some donor receptor uh, ability and it's gonna have some donor receptor responsibility. So it has to be able to fit into the right receptor in order for it to be effective. And actually, one of the tests they did at the end was they tested their compound that they had synthesized uh, against like some type of a genetic pathway that called, caused like a, a proline or some, some other amino acid to, to form a rotomer. They actually took their compound and they showed that it inhibited that pathway. And so they knew they had the right thing. In addition to all the other spectroscopic data that you know, kind of confirm what they had, right? So these three fragments we're gonna talk about and we're gonna go through the reactions for those fragments. So they started out with a very simple compound, arabitol, right? It's a commercially available alcohol. Started out with that and then converted uh, arabitol to this structure right here, right? Where you had Basically, the two alcohols on the end are substituted with chlorine, and then the two alcohols up top get isolated, right? And then uh, treating, treating this with sodium methoxide, right? What they were able to do is cyclize that, right? You can see right here, the sodium methoxide is used to remove these acetate groups and once those acetate groups are taken off, you can see immediately, right, they cyclized here just with a simple SN2 type substitution to make these epoxides. And then the second step, they added in benzyl bromide, which is a protecting group to protect this alcohol, All right? And then from there, uh, I think I left off, God dang it, I think I left off a step. Uh, well, from here, they added in the alkyne groups here to open up the, uh, open up the epoxides. So these alkynes here were added in as nucleophiles, right? So you, I think they started out with, uh, let me find it right quick. Yeah, right here. Yeah. This yeah, they started out with the lithiated version of the of uh, the alkyne, right? And then just added that in. I, I don't believe I left that stuff off. 
but I apologize for that. So to go from here to here, they basically took, the, took an alkyne. Uh, I need to be able to annotate this. So they took this alkyne right here. All right, and that, and in the presence of uh, BF3 ether rate. All right, and they were able to, this, so this is a nucleophile and they were able to open that epoxide with that nucleophile on both sides. And in the process, uh, the stereo centers maintain their integrity because Arabitol already had those two alcohol stereo centers set. All right, let me go back to... All right, so with that uh, dialkyne in hand, treating that with HCl and methanol, actually set this up to, uh, to cyclize. This is a, actually a very uh, intriguing mechanism to that cyclization. And we can talk about that uh, later, right? But they, but the HCl and methanol remove those uh, ethers, right? Converted them into alcohols. Then it's set up like this tautomerization so that the, you can cyclize into the, to both sides, both sides cyclize to these uh, five member lactones, all right? And then just treating the lactone with a strong base LDA and then a simple a nucleophile methyl iodide, right? You, you notice the stereochemistry, right? So the, the stereochemistry here is predicated on what the stereochemistry is here. So that's going back into the page. So the, when the methyl group adds, it's going to add to the opposite side of that. The same thing here. This is coming out of the page. So the methyl group adds to the opposite side of that. Right, but that uh, HCl and methanol kind of set off this reaction here because it that's actually a way to uh, remove ethers and convert an ether back into an alcohol. Uh, so if you look here, this is the final, yeah, this is the final uh, part of that fragment right here. And I'm gonna show you how they coupled it all together too at the end. Uh, but here, it's just a simple uh, ring opening treated with sodium hydroxide and then sodium hydride and methyl iodide. And you, you actually can pop those lactones open. Uh, and you can see here, right, this is the fragment that you generate. So you can already start to see the backbone of that fragment uh, coming into, coming into uh, fruition, coming to fruition. You can see the three stereo centers that are set here. You can also see another stereo center set here. Um, so yeah, so then after that, that the, uh, they hydrogenated down the ester and then added in uh, PPTS and that actually helped that uh, to cyclize. So that PPTS is gonna take off the benzyl protecting group and now you get this cyclization right here. So you can see the six member ring here, right? That's gonna cyclize. And that's what to a six member uh, lactone. So that's where you are here, all right? All of these steps, again, are, are playing off of the initial uh, stereochemistry from that arabitol, right? That's, that kind of set the stage for everything. So if you notice, none of this is, has been done in, with an asymmetric catalyst or anything like that, not yet. Uh, but all of this is, is, is using the pre-existing stereo centers that were in Arabitol to kind of guide the, uh, the stereochemical outcome, right? And then so I take this and treat it with L-selectride, which is a, a reducing agent. And you notice it's a, a pretty mild reducing agent because it reduced down the uh, ester without popping it open, right? But what it did was basically convert that ester into a uh, a hemiacetal, right? 
But L selectride is a hydride source. It's a, a very mild reducing agent. Again, it can reduce down an ester without even without uh, hydrolyzing it, which is what happened here. And then from there, uh, the hemiacetal is really like just a masked aldehyde. And so when they added in this uh, dithiol here with BF3 etherate, you actually just take that hemiacetal and convert it into uh, this, dot, this dithiol here, right? And so that's where, that's where this fragment comes from here. And then treating that with LAH, which is a reducing agent like a L selectride, it's a source of hydride, H minus, lithium aluminum hydride, to pop this uh, ester open, then convert the subsequent alcohol into an iodide. And then the, well, actually, let me, let me zoom in here because you're going to get an alcohol here. Right, you're going to get an alcohol here. At, you'll get an alcohol here, but you're also going to convert that carbonyl into an alcohol. So that alcohol right here, it would have been here, but the triphenylphosphine iodide converts that to an iodide, right? And then you just protect the alcohol that you form here as a TBS ether. All right, so all of these. Uh, steps are geared to build up this fragment. So the, pur the purpose of converting that to an iodide is to add in uh, this phosphonate to here. And that's what you have here. And if you look back at the original structure, right, this is what the original structure is. And right here, it was a uh, amide, a phosphodiamide, but over here, Right, it's just a phosphine, a phosphine oxide. But this is the precursor to the diamond, right? All this is, was published in, the, in their seminal work in 1989 dealing with uh, So they published like three back-to-back -back communications and each communication uh, described the, the synthesis of one of those fragments, right? Complete with all the supporting information and all that stuff, which I'm gonna show you in a second. Uh, so the, the second fragment, which is this fragment right here or something similar to it, all right, uh, was sent, was a, a little bit simpler synthetically, uh, but it was still accomplished and, you know, and they're getting, if you notice on each one of these steps, I'm putting in like the yields, like 85%, 90%. So these are all high yielding, um, reactions, right? So. They hydrogenated in the first step here, they hydrogenated this carbonyl, right? Asymmetrically. So this is the only asymmetric uh, step that's in here. Everything else is based on pre-existing stereo centers already uh, there being used to control the stereo chemistry of, of other reactions. But here they use a ruthenium uh, BINAP catalyst, right? And you've seen BINAP already. Uh, when we talked about asymmetric catalysis, I get, showed you what that looks like. It's a uh, C2 symmetric phosphine ligand. And so that is, they did asymmetric hydrogenation on this carbonyl to get this alcohol, right? And then after that, they treated it, treated this, uh, well, the alcohol that resulted from that with LDA, which is a strong base, lithium diisopropyl amide and then allobromide. So they got this structure. And again, this stereo center is, is set based on the stereo center that's, all, that's set right here, right? And then treating that with LAH is going to knock off this ester, reduce it down to the alcohol. Uh, and then uh, treating it with DDQ, DDQ is used to remove the uh, paramethoxy benzyl protecting group but actually when they removed it they all they also subsequently uh came right back and used that same group 
Now it's a paramethoxyphenol uh, to protect that diol, right? And that's important. Again, when we talk about protecting roots, right? Protective roots are, are necessary if you have functional roots that you do not want to react, right? Or you don't want to participate in other reactions, right? So here, right? Treatment with a base plus iodine is going to uh, iodinate the alkene and then the uh, addition of dibal. Uh oh. Sorry about that. Right, the addition of, of dibal is going to uh, pop that ring open here. Right, Let's pop this open, remove that PMP, and then that the, there's a cyclization that happens here. Right, once this is iodinated, right, there's a cyclization that's going to happen here, because the I the the I two ends up converting the alkene into a dihalide, and then the oxygen that's adjacent to it is going to uh, cyclize, just a simple SN two type substitution to cyclize. So that's how we got this cyclic ether down here, right? So we have this, <coughs> excuse me, this cyclic ether. And then the dibel again, deprotects, freeing up that, uh, the both hydroxyl groups. And then you do the, uh, use the desmartin pyridinine, which is an oxidant to oxidize the free alcohol here. All right, that's a very a very uh, specialized oxidant, that's Martin. All right, and then in the next step, uh, they did a TAM catalyzed allylation. It's called a Keck allylation. All right, so the, the allostanane that you have here is going to attack your aldehyde, right? And that's the group that you had, that's, that's the group that you see over here, but it doesn't attack from where you would expect, right? You'd expect it to attack from this carbon right here. Right, you expect it to attack from, from this carbon. Sorry about that. All right, you expect it to attack from here. All right, but it doesn't. It actually attacks from this side. And that's what that's how you see that substitution pattern here because it's this carbon where the hot where the uh, undefined hydrogen is, because you get both isomers to cis and the trans. Uh, it's that carbon that attacks that aldehyde. All right. So that's how you end up with this. Uh, beta allyl alcohol. And then again, now we're going back to just simple protection, deprotection chemistry. So you protect the free alcohol with TBS triflate, and then you do ozonolysis on the alkene here to give you a aldehyde. And then you add in a vinyl granule reagent, right? So the vinyl granule, let me see if I can the vinyl granule is just here, All right? So you add that into that aldehyde and that is going to uh, give you this alcohol right here, All right? So again, all of these like little steps in between that we're looking at, a lot of this stuff, the reason I added this is so we can kind of bring all this stuff together and see it in action. Right, because we've talked a lot about protecting groups. We talked about uh, some of these other reactions also. And then some of this stuff we learned already in like organic one, organic two, the ozonolysis, green reagents. Uh, we haven't talked about hydrogenation, but that's we're gonna talk about that later. That's another topic. All right. So with this structure in hand, right, they basically uh had two pathways and to this second fragment 
And this fragment is actually one carbon longer than the fragment that's shown uh, in the retrosynthesis. But they actually had two, two different pathways. So one pathway, they just protected the alcohol out here as a mem ether right here. And then just did another ozonolysis on that alkene um, to convert it into an aldehyde, right? And then the other strategy was to um, take off the TBS protecting group right here with TBAF, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, and then come back and say and, and protect that as an acetal, right? And then do the ozonolysis. So those two strategies, a lot of times when, when uh, you're doing a total synthesis, the, the goal is to optimize it. And so I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think this strategy here won out as far as how they wanted to, how they wanted to make that uh, second fragment and how they wanted to protect it so that it's always a long range thought process too, because the protecting groups to kind of help you to map out what your next steps are. So when you get to the end, you can selectively deprotect, you know, those uh, those alcohols as needed, right? So that's a, that's a very important uh, part of the synthetic strategy is those protecting groups. Uh, so here you have the third fragment, which is here, and again, this is the only the second asymmetric reaction that's, that's done in the whole synthesis. Everything else is based on pre-existing stereo centers. So they did sharpless asymmetric uh, epoxidation here. We talked about that when we talked about like the uh, one, two, uh, A12 interactions and A13 interactions, but they did it this sharpless followed by kinetic resolution. So we talked about that last week when we talked about how you induce chirality. So Sharpless gave this epoxide, the uh, Sharpless asymmetric epoxidation, and then followed by kinetic resolution of the two enantiomers, right? So you get those, you resolve them, and this is the enantiomer that they kept, and it's 97% EE, 58% yield, which is not bad. Uh, so in the next step here, you wanna first protect this alcohol as a PMB ether, which is what the first step is. And then the second step, you wanna add in uh, this alkyne here. And that's what this is in the second step, followed by uh, sodium hydride, right? So that, that and, and the sodium um, hydride, methyl iodide, pops open your epoxide, right? So that gives you this structure right here. All right? And then you add in mercury chloride, uh, DDQ to deprotect the PMB ether. Uh, the mer mercury chloride is to remove the uh, ethyl ether right here. Take that off, convert it into a alcohol and then you can tautomerize and get to a, a carbonyl type uh, structure where, where the oxygen here once it's deprotected can cyclize into the lactone right so that's that's here uh, and then uh, toluene sulfonic acid right here is used also to just as a, a protonate agent All right then then you get to here and you add in triethylamine, which is gonna form the enolate, which we did, we, we talked about that too. It'll form the enolate here, and then you just trap it with TBS triflate, right? Remember with the enolate, I mean, the enolate would look like, for that lactone would look like this. So if you treat that with a base, It just looks like that, right? And so that you can trap with TBS, I'm just gonna put an X, chloride, triflate, iodide, however you wanna, whichever one you wanna use. But that's what that step does. It actually forms the enolate of the ester and it traps it. 
And then this this um, last step here is really interesting because what they actually did was they built this to do a Claisen rearrangement, right? And and right here, this is what the proposed confirmation is for the Claisen. So you can see this uh, ring is kind of folded up. It's not quite a, uh, in a boat confirmation. I'm not really even sure what what we would, how we would describe it. It's not a boat, it's not a twist boat, it's not a chair, but it's just set up so that the two PA systems can overlap, right? Because when we talked about the Claisen, the Claisen was actually a 3-3 sigma tropic rearrangement. And you can see that it's an allyl ether on this side. You got an allyl ether on that side and you have a alkene on the other side. So it's set up to do an Ireland Claisen uh, rearrangement, which gives you this structure right here. All right, so you can see like up to this point, just about all the reactions that we've studied in this class are, all, are involved in this uh, synthesis, right? So you have the Ireland Claisen rearrangement and then follow that up with a simple um, reduction of your acid here down to the alcohol. All right, and this was published again in uh, JOC uh, 1989 and it was like uh, volume 54, page nine, right? So now we got the alcohol here. We can convert it to an iodide and then treat it with the sulfone. And then, um, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. So here, I'm missing an OH group. That should be an OH group here on this carbon right here. That's the purpose of the BH3 and the hydrogen peroxide is to convert this alkene into an alcohol. So this, this should actually, oh, it's there. I just couldn't see it. It was underneath the arrow, All right? So that OH, in the third step down here is what is going to get uh, protected with TBS triflate. So that's how I end up here. So that's the actual uh, third fragment, the smaller fragment. Uh, and you can see even this fragment took multiple steps to get here. So these synthetic routes, you know, is really important, like the, the, um, the less steps you have or the more efficient the synthesis is, the more valuable it is as far as like being able to scale it up and use it on an industrial scale. Because a lot of, again, a lot of these synthetic routes have been translated from the bench to uh, industrial scale, especially in, in terms of like really important pharmaceutical compounds or bioactive compounds, right? So here's the proposed coupling strategy. So this part right here, which is an analog of, this is from a different paper. It's an analog of that backbone that we first built up, that first fragment. And then you got this cell phone that we just built, built in the on the last slide. Uh, so you do a, a Desmartin and then followed by uh, so using sodium amalgam, that's just to remove uh, the sulfone here. It's kind of similar to what happened with uh, a Julia coupling. So now you have this couple piece here and then you just treat it with T-bath and that's going to take off the, uh, the uh, protecting groups followed by TBS chloride, right? To replace the protecting groups and then uh, DDQ, which takes off the PMB ether here, right? And then forms that PMP kind of acetal between these two. So the T bath is gonna remove this protecting group. Uh, the uh, DDQ is gonna remove this one. And then uh, form that PMP acetal here. And then you come back with the TBS to put the TBS groups back on, right? The ones you need on. Uh, so here, methyl magnesium bromide added to here, right? Followed by the Burgess reagent, which is just a 
uh, a reagent that facilitates elimination, right? So now you now you have this fragment in hand, and that's that's the coupling strategy that was uh, devised to close up the microcycle. Right, that's like the final step to close everything up. So you can see here, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but you can see here, they started out with this acyclic structure and began adding in these other pieces, right? So that they could eventually close that macrocycle up. This was the total yield. All of that work, all of those steps, all of the NMR, mass spec, uh, other spectroscopic methods, infrared, and this is what they got, 10 milligrams, right? And you're talking about probably a couple of years of work, maybe a year, two years of work to build this thing up and your total yield is 10 milligrams. So again, when you, if you're able to scale this up, right? That's, the, that's always the goal. So the more efficient the strategy, the, the more you're able to scale up. Uh, and this is just a sample of <coughs> the supporting information. So anytime you do uh, organic, right, anytime you do organic, you always have to do this, right? The supporting information. And so at the top part of that, you can see that there's a procedure done, right? You write out the procedure. So if somebody wants to repeat your work, then they'll be able to repeat it with no problem. And this is all, all a lot of ethical concerns, right? You can't just publish something without proving that you did it. So you got a, you got your procedure right here. And then underneath, you have your NMR, where whatever the, whatever the compound is you made, you have to take the NMR. You have to resolve the peaks. So it's got to be clean. It can't have any impurities. And you have to calculate the coupling constants. Uh, you also have to uh, resolve the peaks, right? So this peak right here, you see that D, 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 that means it's a doublet of doublet of doublets. Uh, D, D is a doublet of doublets, so on and so forth. So you have to like resolve all of your peaks and calculate uh, your J values and give the chemical shift, which is right here, and the integration. So where the proton actually shows up. So this was show uh, this proton in particular showed up at 1.3 parts per million, and it was one proton integrated for one proton. Right here, this doublet of doublet of doublets, uh, the, the J value is 17.2 hertz, and then right here 10.5 and 6.2, and that's one hydrogen, so on and so forth. Right? You also have to give. I don't know if I put that on here or not. But you also have to give like infrared values. All right, so your infrared values are here. All right, and that's just confirming what functional groups are present. And you have to do a uh, high red, high res mass spec. So here you have carbon, NMR, proton NMR, infrared and mass spec, which I think I got cut that part off, but you have to do a high res mass spec also. So anytime you make anything, this, these are the fragments, but they also had to do the same thing for the final product, the FK506 final product, where they had to go through and give all the chemical shifts, all of the coupling constants, all of the uh, splitting patterns for each proton and things like that. So, Keep that in mind when we talk about a synthetic pathway, that not only are you synthesizing the molecule, but you also have to uh, characterize it. And so that characterization is a big part of what, what you do as a synthetic chemist, all right? Um, so before I shift gears back to this, these uh, coupling reactions, are there any questions about the synthesis of FK506. And the reason I, again, the reason I did this is because I wanted us to see how uh, all the stuff that we've been talking about up to this point, how it kind of ties together and how it's applied. But then the second part is there's a, 
couple of questions on the uh, third problem set that uh, that you can uh, deduce from using this synthesis of FK506. Any questions about that? No, sir. All right. All right, so what we're gonna do, well, we got, got a few minutes though. What we're gonna do here is shift gears back to these coupling reactions. And what we've already talked about, I think it's a, this will be a good segue because I think Jonathan had a, was supposed to present at the beginning, but I just started talking and forgot. Uh, but you can kind of segue us back to coupling, uh, Jonathan, with your paper. And I think I can pull that up. Okay. Let me pull it up right quick. Does my screen still share? Yes. yes. Okay, good. All right. I just want to make sure. Let me find this email right quick from Star and I'll pull that up. Let's go. Uh, yeah, no, free. That's the one. So this will this will segue us back because because this is a um, the organometallic coupling part. This is a uh, analogous to that, which is not using the metal, right? So these frustrated Lewis pairs are great ways to couple and form new carbon carbon bonds without without the presence of metal. I think that's why that's how we got. That's where we see this utility in that you don't need a metal in order for it to, to work. So go ahead, John. I think that's the wrong paper. That's my paper, Dr. Russell. Oh, my bad. Look at y'all taking up for each other. But uh, yeah. uh, I'm just, <laughs> just joking with it. You uh, had the carbon NH there. NH yeah. yeah, here we go. Here we go. I mean, this one. Yep. I know I brought it out for you. All right, so basically in this paper, they used the uh, NHC catalyzed switchable reaction of anals and azo, um, alkenes. They basically used a four plus mm. three and four plus one uh, to allow for basically like a chemical reaction in which a new ring was constructed on the molecule for synthesis of a mm -hmm. one, two, uh, drazepine and uh, pyrazole. So, uh, <clears throat> I guess the goal is basically to uh, create selectivity of a four plus three reaction uh, between the anals and the al uh, alkenes. Uh, mm -hmm. They they modified the NHC catalyst four plus one to basically function on the power zones. Okay, so the NHC itself, uh huh, what is that? The NHC. Is that the uh, what is that? What is the acronym? Oh, you said what does the NHC stand for? Mm -hmm. Uh in Yeah, so it's the it's the carbene, the N heterocyclic carbene. Carbene, yeah. But did yeah, yeah. So let me ask this question. So here with the NHC. Here. Uh-huh. Right. They have one NHC1 and NHC2. Did they talk about like how it works? Let me go up to yeah, because here, where's your quite a carbine? I know they're in here. Yeah, here, here they are right here. So with, are you talking about like how they're saying? Mm -hmm. 
Like, are you how, about- how do you how do you differentiate? Or how, how do you get to? Um, okay, here they are down here. The five five A five B five C. So all these are your in heterocyclic carbenes, right? Carbenes. But they're not. These are not carbenes. These are precursors to the carbene, right? Because the carbene is going to be on um, this carbon. I can't write on this. Oh yes, I can. Let me see. Yeah, so your carbene is going to be here or here or here. But mm-hmm. what do they, how do they differentiate? How do they tune it to get four plus one, which would be this one right here, or four plus three? Like, what's the, what's the criteria for favoring one over the other? Did they talk about that? Uh, from what I read, I think they did. I don't think I kind of went into that too much. Let's see. So is it, I think they were kind of basically, was it, the, go ahead. No, go ahead. So with the NH, let's see, the different ones. So you're basically saying which, how do they depict which ones they were using or yeah, no, the, the, what I'm asking is how do you get one over the other? Like, it looks like it's tunable, right? It's a it tunable, tunable reaction yeah. to where you can, yeah, so you could take one uh, carbine or another carbine, and that's going to determine which reaction you get. Like, how did they determine uh-huh. it? How did they determine which carbine you get? Gave you what reaction. Well, I know they, I know they modified the NH as catalysts. Mm-hmm. Uh, they basically funnelized, uh, functionalized their power zones, but I don't know how they actually tune it or created the selectivity, I guess you say, tune it to actually do what they wanted to do. Well, it looks like, so here's the, here's the mechanism. Yeah, here's the mechanism right here. So your NHC, depending uh-huh. on, NH, you can see it right here. Where it says NHC equals 5C. Yeah, 5C gives you the 4 plus 3, and then 5I gives you the 4 plus 1. Uh-huh. So it depends on what 5C is. Let's see if we can figure this out, what the uh, functionality is. So 5C, the aromatic group is 246 trimethyl benzene right here you see that uh-huh. and then 5i okay i see it 5i is 26 dimethyl benzene so the, what what do you think the difference is between those two i i know what, what it is i'm asking to see if you if you know or if they talked about it what do you think the difference is between those two right you have uh how can i darken this up let me see Man, that's bad. Never mind. But yeah, how, what what what's the difference in those two? Yeah. So you got something like this. I have no idea. Um. So that's one of them, and the other one. The uh, need a ruler. The other one looks like this, and I know this is kind of weird, but with just methyl groups around it, right? What 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 do you think the difference is between having methoxy groups attached versus having methyl groups? Methyl attached? group. Mm-hmm. That's that's gonna that's gonna uh, help to. Yeah, it's going to help you understand why they chose one NHC over the other, depending on what outcome they wanted. So right. is that is that because of the way they're trying to um, catalyze the selectivity or the reaction? Yeah, but it's 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 a different. Like remember, we talked about the reaction is going to be controlled by one or two things, either sterics or electronics. Yes, yeah, so I know this one is steric. Somewhat, but it's also electronic. 
the methoxy hmm. groups are much more electron rich than the uh, trimethyl, well, the, the trimethyl benzene. So you think about that in terms of, right, in terms of reactivity, it's okay. probably some electronic effect from those methoxy groups being more, so much more electron rich. So that's the methoxy groups are on 5I and then the methyl groups are on 5C. So if we go back down here to this table, come on. So 5C, a little bit less electron rich is going to favor the 4 plus 3. And then 5I, mm -hmm. that, which is more electron rich, is going to favor the 4, the four plus, plus 1. one. So okay. really, it looks like it's dependent on the electronic the electronics of that carbene, right? Because here's your carbene right here. And then here's the aromatic group. That's aromatic. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah, this is an interesting paper, man, because this that, those uh, triazoles are not trivial to make. They're very difficult to get. Very difficult. So you can do it with a in, in, in heterocyclic carbene and no metal. That's, that's mm -hmm. the utility of this process. So, yeah. So that's good. Yeah, we, I'm going to actually, this is going to make me, force me to like change that whole coupling presentation because this is a totally new method for coupling that I was unaware of until uh, Sam brought it up. So yeah, it's good. This is good. This is good. Uh, I think it's 11. I think we've got to stop here. But we'll pick up, uh, we'll pick up.